Many of my early, hazy childhood memories are of TV coverage of the Vietnam War. A Vic was seeing similar news reports in the Philippines. The images of the fall of Saigon in 1975, with helicopters dumped in the ocean, the evacuation of the U.S. Embassy, and South Vietnamese citizens being left behind really stuck in my memory. Blockbuster movies came out in the late 1970s and early 80s. But of course, everything we saw was told from the American perspective. So when we went to Vietnam, we wanted to try and understand the Vietnamese perspective. To do that, we visited museums and sites in Saigon, Hue, and Hanoi. The history and legend of Vietnamese national identity began 2100 years ago with the Chinese domination of Vietnam. For the next 1900 years, war after war was fought against Chinese dynasties until the Nguyen dynasty finally united the territory in 1802. Within 60 years, the Nguyen dynasty was at war with the French, their former ally. By 1862, Southern Vietnam was a French colony. Hanoi was attacked in 1873, and the rest of Vietnam was annexed. By all accounts, French rule was brutal. They modernized agriculture and infrastructure, but only to facilitate exports. Half of the Vietnamese lost their land to French plantation owners. Most of the population suffered from severe malnutrition. Civil unrest was widespread, and Maison Centrale Hoa Lo Prison was built for political prisoners. Hoa Lo means fiery furnace or stove, as area shops sold wood and coal stoves prior to the prison's construction. It came to mean hell's hole, for the torture and generally hellish conditions that prisoners were subjected to. The French also used guillotines to execute hundreds of Vietnamese. The close confines of the prison became an incubator for revolutionaries. The French and their Vietnamese elite collaborators lived aristocratic lives, ironically similar to the conditions that led to the French Revolution a century before. During World War II, the government sided with the Nazi-aligned Vichy French and their Japanese allies. In 1941, the Viet Minh, a nationalist front founded by communist revolutionary Ho Chi Minh, led the resistance against the Japanese and French. In 1945, the Viet Minh captured Hanoi and accepted the abdication of Emperor Bao Dai in Hue. Declaring an independent Vietnam, they petitioned President Harry Truman for recognition under the Atlantic Charter. This 1941 American-British statement set out goals for a post-war world that included, they respect the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they will live, and they wish to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them. At the end of World War I, Vietnamese nationalists had petitioned President Woodrow Wilson, a vocal opponent of European colonialism and champion of self-determination. But the U.S. government sided with the French. And even though the Atlantic Charter was the basis for granting independence to the U.S. colony of the Philippines, the U.S. once again supported colonial rule in Vietnam. Feeling betrayed by the United States, who had supported the Viet Minh against the Japanese, and viewing the French as foreign occupiers, the Viet Minh declared war in 1946. The first Indochina War lasted until 1954, when the French were decisively defeated at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. The 1954 Geneva Conference divided Vietnam at the 17th parallel and was supposed to have resolved all the issues of the Indochina War. The conference's final declaration provided that a general election be held by July 1956 to create a unified Vietnamese state. Neither the United States nor South Vietnam signed the conference accords, and the elections were never held though it's widely accepted that the Viet Minh had enough support to have won. With the accords null and void, 
North Vietnam initiated a resistance war in 1955 to the Viet Cong, their military organization in the South. The president of the South, Ngo Dinh Diem, won by rigged election in 1955. Viewed by the North as a United States puppet, he moved into the French governor's palace, renaming it Independence Palace. Jim's rule was divisive, authoritarian, and nepotistic. A devout Catholic, his increasingly anti-Buddhist policies made him unpopular in a country of over 70% Buddhists. South Vietnamese military officers attempted coups in 1960 and 1962, air bombing the palace in 62. Jim's response was to rebuild with an underground command bunker, though he didn't live to see it finished. The tipping point came in June 1963 when a Buddhist monk from Hue, Thich Quang Duc, self-immolated in the middle of Saigon. On November 2, 1963, Jim was assassinated in a third successful coup. From 1963 to 1967, Multiple coups and dictatorships rocked the southern government. The command bunker saw a lot of use. Anti-Buddhist policies continued, and public executions by guillotine in villages around the country, with imprisonment of political prisoners in so-called tiger cages that were left by the French, were common practices. The United States increased its military involvement try and prop up the failing government. The war, officially a police action to the United States, was viewed in the North as a patriotic fight for independence against an invader that had abandoned its founding principles and broken international law in order to exploit the region's resources. Both the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the Declaration of the French Revolution were cited in the 1945 Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. This sentiment was shared by some in the U.S. government and the international community. Growing up in the U.S., Betsy Ross, Rosie the Riveter, and the nurses from MASH were our primary images of women in war. In Vietnam, since the legendary Chung sisters rebelled against China 2,000 years ago, women have been warriors. The Vietnam Women's Union was founded in 1930, partly to organize guerrilla units. Nearly one million women were Viet Cong soldiers, and women were a key part of the North's espionage network. At least 1.5 million served in the North Vietnamese military. Many women are Vietnamese national heroes from the war, including Nguyen Thi Dinh, who fought during World War II, was a founding member of the Viet Cong, and rose to the rank of Major General, leading the Long-Haired Warriors from 1965 to 1975. The United States Air Forces had overwhelming superiority throughout the war, and between 1964 and 1975, over seven and a half million tons of bombs were dropped on Vietnam and neighboring Laos and Cambodia, more than double the amount dropped on all of Europe and Asia during World War II. It remains the largest aerial bombardment in human history. From the Vietnamese perspective, they take pride at being able to resist such staggering attacks, taking shelter wherever they could. They did have Soviet-provided anti-aircraft defenses, and they commemorate every plane they shot down, especially the mighty B-52 bombers. They also commemorated the downed and captured pilots, dozens of who were detained at Hoelo Prison, originally built by the French and known to us Americans as the Hanoi Hilton. One notable pilot landed in a small lake in the north of Hanoi. A marker just off the road honors the Hanoi citizens who pulled future U.S. Senator John McCain out of the water in 1967. The images displayed in the prison museum directly contradict the horrific descriptions of torture and inhumane treatment that McCain and other POWs testified to. 
Given the prison's century-long nightmare reputation, it's clear that life there wasn't all Christmas parties and games of chess. Nonetheless, the prison also honors McCain's efforts, along with other former POWs, towards reconciliation with Vietnam, one of his greatest legacies. On January 31, 1968, North Vietnam launched a multi-city attack on U.S. and South Vietnamese forces known as the Tet Offensive. The Battle of Hue, in the centrally located cultural capital of Vietnam, was one of the largest and bloodiest of the entire war. The Tet Offensive was a military defeat for the North, but a major political victory. It prompted trusted news anchor Walter Cronkite to editorialize to his nationwide audience about the need to end the war. And it was pivotal in turning U.S. popular opinion against the war. So I was really surprised when I found almost no mention of the Tet Offensive or the Battle of Hue during our visit. One City Park commemorates one of the heaviest days of fighting, and only a few photos are shown of the Imperial Palace in the aftermath. Vietnam was reunified 47 years ago, but the after-effects of the war are still felt today. About 5% of the population, between 2 to 3 million Vietnamese soldiers and civilians, died across both sides. Nearly a million refugees successfully left the South, and at least another quarter million died trying to flee. Unexploded mines, bombs, and bomblets still make farmland unusable and have killed tens of thousands of civilians. Underwater mines make parts of Halong Bay unusable. 20 million gallons of Agent Orange and other toxic chemicals sprayed by the U.S. military still poison tens of thousands of acres of land. Millions of Vietnamese and thousands of U.S. veterans are victims of dioxin poisoning from these substances, including horrific birth defects. Though, of course, there's never been any legal or financial accountability. Today, Vietnam is poor but bustling and hopeful. We never felt any hostility, even eating in a restaurant owned by a war veteran. Though the war is definitely remembered, as are the U.S. wartime leaders.